to jump 1,000 cars. Sir, you have a 1,000 cars. I don't think I'd attempt to try this stunt. Or we, we, we owe this horsepower to Uncle Sam. Oh, Too many cars. Car. You know, roses would be... Uh... Like, I put my beer belly on it. Yeah. You can't immediately tell somebody how many cars you have. You'll really give those uppity yuppies something to think about. Stay on the bar. Don't go yeah. off the bar with your Bronco. 1980 Volvo horns. What's right? Like, me, me. Yeah, I want a man's coolant. <laughs> And he's like, oh, I thought it'd be small. It's for a small car. And I'm like, yeah, but it's, it's still an automatic transmission. They're never going to be light. It's definitely going to have to crash. Starting off with Brad buying another car. That's the West. <laughs> Internet. You know, is this a Nigerian oil print? Uh, I also wish you drove a tan Camry. Anyways, anyway, that, that's har- a horrible, very horrible podcast content. A very a inside joke. They'd love to be driven hard. All right. Welcome to another episode of Auto Off Topic. Hello, Brad. Evening, Andrew. How are you? I'm great. Hey, we got something new, or I guess, I guess it's new for people. We actually have some guests tonight. Uh, we have uh, Mercedes. Yeah, it's new. And... It's, been, it's been like a while. It's yeah, been like have... a, I don't know. They may have been our last guests. It's been some time since we had a guest on. <laughs> Possibly. So we've got Mercedes and Andy Lilienthal. Hey, you guys. Hello, hello. You know what I meant to do was look up and see which episodes you were on in the past, and I forgot in all that time. So we'll I'll add it back. in post. I will. Um, I've got some. Uh, I got a little Mitsubishi trivia. Oh, to start because I know we're big Mitsubishi fans here. Mm-hmm. If, um, if they get it wrong, are they not allowed to record? Not really <laughs> wrong, but it's. Uh, I, it's like a thing like did you know more like okay. i i only learned this like two days ago um and because so we just had the summer olympics right yep and the next summer olympics is going back to la mm-hmm. yes and the last time they were in la was 1984 it was the summer olympics mm-hmm. what i didn't realize because normally the winter olympics and summer olympics are not on the same year right did you, know, did you know there was the 84 Winter Olympics? Yes. I, I, I can't remember. I think it was nine. Was it 94 the first year they split them off, summer and winter? May have been. And they were in Lillehammer, right? Yeah. So, we were in 80, Lillehammer uh, yeah. a month ago. <laughs> oh, perfect. What synchronicity. So do you know where the 84 Winter Games were? 84 winter games that was in munich was it uh let's see it wasn't nagano that was that was later that was Um, in music or munich was it nope munich was 72 72 yeah uh let's see 84 um calgary no i'm way off of my olympics calgary i think was 88 yeah it wasn't sarajevo was it it was sarajevo (laughs) oh um what i didn't know and i only learned this recently Mitsubishi was the official vehicle supplier of the 84 Winter Olympics. Oh, wow. Well, and I believe 84 was also the first year of the uh, Montero Pajero. And I'm trying to remember if 84 was the first official year Mitsubishi was sold as a standalone brand in the United States, too. I believe it was. It was that or 82, maybe? Awesome. So 1983 was the first year of Mitsu in the States. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they had just yeah. launched the Piero and also I think the first gen Delica. So there's pictures of, um, I found one picture of a bunch of you know, like dark blue Monteros and dark blue Delicas they use to transport athletes around. Oh, interesting. Well, it'll be, That's not cool. to get too Mitsubishi nerdy here, but. Uh, yeah, oh, the, the original, that's fine. Go the original as nerdy as you Delic- want. The, <laughs> the oh, original Delica. Who are you talking were, to right here? I believe the the first generation Delica van was technically 1968. Oh, okay. it had a little 1.1 liter four cylinder. Uh, this the the modern Star Wagon, or the modern Delica Star Wagon that most people are are familiar with is was was 86. So, but there was this body on frame Delica between the first one and the, and the Star Wagon, uh, which they kind of just evolved and, and uh, they had Delica pickup trucks and they had Delica camper vans or campers, RVs, and they were all on that body on frame chassis. But in 86, they went unibody 
And but there were those in the in the early eighties, eighty two, eighty three for sure would have been that body on frame Delica, and I believe that was the version that was used in uh, as support in the Paradacar rally as well. Mm-hmm. And what were the years again? Was it um, the later 80s that w- it was known as the Mitsubishi van right here in the States? Yeah. Just only a couple of years, right? Yeah, 87 through 90 was the rear wheel drive 2.4 liter, which is the 4G64, uh, sold in the United States, automatic only. I remember seeing one at White Bear Mitsubishi as a kid thinking, man, this is so cool. It's got these seats in the back and they swivel around like 180 <laughs> degrees or 270 degrees. Anyway. So the how I found that out was, uh, yeah, I was on Instagram and there's an account. It's like Piero Evolution Brazil. Mm-hmm. I usually post like vintage pictures of Piero's just doing Dakar stuff. Um, and they had a picture of an advert. And in the bottom right corner, it had this little caricature of a wolf with a Mitsubishi logo on like a scarf. And I was like, I've never seen that before. Where does that come from? Like I commented on the on the post mm-hmm. and then nobody said anything. And then a few days, and like yesterday, somebody commented like, oh, it's Vushko. It was the mascot. So V-U-C-K-O, I guess it's pronounced okay. Vushko, is the mascot for the 84 Winter Olympic Games. And I was like, Okay, so then I looked it up, and sure enough, Mitsubishi was the official motor vehicle supplier to the 84 Winter Olympic Games. I was like, I did not know that. Huh, that's so cool. So I'm sure you've seen the $1,200 poster for sale on eBay. It's the only thing I can find about this whole yep. scenario. Yep, I no, found it yesterday. Yeah. I was like, man, that is a really cool poster, but not $1,200 cool. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I'll I'll send you guys, There's a I found an Instagram uh, person who actually owns one of the old Delicas and is restoring it, so... Yeah, it's it's funny because you could bring one in, but like nobody does to to North America. Most people go, you know, they start at the Star Wagon. I think a lot of people don't even realize that there was a Delica well before the '86 Star Wagon. Mm-hmm. So, cool little piece of uh, Mitsubishi trivia to start us off here. But anyway, we didn't uh, we don't want to talk all about uh, old Mitsubishi stuff this uh, episode. Um. Well, I mean, listen, we're talking about old Mitsubishi and the Olympics. It's very timely, Andrew. It is. It is. Um, I was just surprised that I was like, man, Mitsubishi sponsored the Olympics. But yeah, 40 years ago makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, Mercedes and Andy, we haven't had you on in a long time. Uh, I think you've done several long distance TSDs rallies. Yeah. Yes. Yes, definitely. We did the... Uh, uh, we did the 2022 uh, Alcan 5000 rally in a Subaru Outback Wilderness, and then we did the that was a summer rally. And then we did the 2024 Subaru. Excuse me, we did the 2024 Alcan 5000 Winter Rally in an Ineos Grenadier, and we actually won our class in that one. And then right. We did, yeah. And then both times we partner with the manufacturers too. So yeah, um, that was a pretty cool experience with both manufacturers. Yeah, and then we just got back from Europe uh, where we did the 2024 Baltic Sea Circle Rally, which was not a TSD rally, uh, but a, a rally nonetheless. And uh, we actually used a Volkswagen ID Buzz, an electric van. Uh, we did 7,500 plus kilometers over 16 days and visited nine countries. Nine countries. Yeah. Yeah, and we we got the vehicle on loan, um, but uh, we basically paid for for all the expenses and all the rest of that because that was our 20-year wedding anniversary gift to each other. Nice. That's right, because nothing says love like sleep deprivation and, uh, you know, uh, getting lost a lot. So. (laughs) Well, thanks for the congratulations, but yeah, like Andy was saying, you know, there's nothing like a like a congratulations to each other about, you know, nothing like a sleep deprivation, um, hunger and, you know, extreme. Where are we this time? And getting the chargers to work because payment is quite interesting. We'll get into that a little in a little bit, but um, trying to pay for all the chargers and yeah. Love is a weird thing. (laughs) Yeah. At least when it comes to the little lethal household. Before before we get into the, the, the whole thing about uh, the charging and the event itself, ID Buzz, is that available for purchase in other places in the world as a co- consumer? Yeah. 
Yes, it's been okay. available since uh, 2022 in parts of Europe. So uh, it has been available because that thing for... has been teased to to the Americans for. Oh yeah, it feels like my entire life. Yes, yes. actually, um... since Columbus first stepped foot. <laughs> No, uh, right. it, it has been. Uh, we have been told not much, but we have been told that we can expect it as a 2025 model debuting in Q4 of 2024. That's all we know. That's all they'll tell us. So uh, that's like now the U.S. will. It's, it's get, Q4 is coming up. Yeah. Right. It's, and it's, so yeah. Um, I, I will say that, uh, you know, the 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 version we had was a short wheelbase with the smaller power plant that is not coming to the United States. We're told we're of getting course. the long wheelbase with the uh, with the both the middle and the higher end power plant, which is over 300 horsepower all wheel drive. Uh, frankly, yeah. ha- after having having driven over 5,000 miles in the in the ID Buzz with the small power four, plant, 4,771 miles to be exact. Yeah, not that we were counting. But you you know who the navigator is. By this the way. is true. I don't know <laughs> anything except just yeah, right Driving. foot, just gas on the right and brake on the left. Right, so, right foot throttle, left foot brake. Yeah, <laughs> I can steer a car pretty well. But anyway. Uh, but yeah, so we've been told we'll be getting the the the, the two more powerful powertrains, which is fine. The ID Buzz with the small one uh, would do 150 kilometers an hour on the Autobahn, which is 93 miles an hour. But that was it. Uh, it didn't accelerate super fast, like zero to 16, 10, 10.2 seconds, like a Subaru Cross Truck. Uh, and uh, but otherwise, it was really really cool. Right. Yeah. And I mean, you know, as far as the 150 kilometers per hour, we only tested that on the motorway when we were using a uh, highway joker. We will get into that or motorway joker. We'll get into more of the rally specifics in just a little uh, a little bit here. But um, had that up there for like maybe three seconds and then brought that back down. And that was on the, the um, Autobahn and Autobahn in Germany when there was no speed limit. Um, but I just wanted to add a point where uh, in, in the U.S., I went to the global reveal of the ID Buzz, the long wheelbase ID Buzz, and my article via Hooniverse dropped on June 7th, 2023. So just wanted to make that known that that was the global reveal. That was in Huntington Beach and that my article dropped then and that was June 7th, 2023. So that was over a year ago that that reveal had. Yeah, I I feel like they announced the new Beetle in 98 and they were like, hey, the bus is coming next. And like (laughs) at the same (laughs) time, it's been the same ever since. And well, now, was, you know, 98 new Beatles are all in junkyards, so. Right. Well, you know, it's it's interesting. When we went to Iceland, we had a trip in Iceland, and we saw our first, I mean, other than my the reveal that I went to, um, the first one I saw on the road was actually a taxi cab driver with an ID buzz, and he was driving like he stole it. It was, it was insane. Yeah, that was I, Iceland one year ago this week, actually. Yeah, it was, because all of my Iceland stories are coming up on social media right now on Facebook. It's pretty funny. But we tried our best to keep up with them so I could video it, because I'm like, Andy, Andy, we got to get it. We got to get it. There's a buzz. And I, I just, we were so excited to see one on the road. We weren't expecting it. We, we figured Europe, yes, we didn't think that they were released yet in Iceland. And we, for the life of us, we couldn't catch up to that guy. He was so wicked fast. I'm like, and that, that, that now we realized was the slowest motor. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's a, uh, it's a Volkswagen van. It's not supposed to be fast. So you, right. you were right. surprised. Yeah. Slow car, fast house. <laughs> but it was so much fun to drive. I mean, Andy, I mean, Andy as a driver, you know, you can talk to, you know, you can talk about uh, those elements as far as the driving aspect of it. Yeah, it really was surprisingly fun to drive uh you know of course all the weights down low and whatnot but it had big i believe they were 20 inch maybe even 21 inch wheels and tires two different set of wheels yeah and it's uh wheels it really it really handled well you know volkswagens usually have really good driving dynamics and and that definitely floods over to the id buzz and we were on some back roads in sweden with some uh other competitors that were in bmws and i can't help but think they were probably like i'm surprised this thing can keep up well, we might want to um, speak a little bit about the rally specifics. So yeah. the Baltic Sea Circle Rally, before we kind of get a little bit too deep in this. I want to know how you found out about this rally. Uh, well, well, yeah. So, Andy, do you want to talk about that? And then I'll talk a little bit about the rally specifics and kind of the yeah. rules. Yeah. So 
after we had completed the Alcan 5000 rally in 2020, that was uh, all the way up to Tuktoyaktuk in the Northwest Territories, somebody had dropped a, a link to this rally group that was in Germany called Superlative Adventure Club, SAC. And well, I remember... It's called SAC. Nobody SAC, calls yeah. it SAC. Right. It's called SAC. I was just spelling it out. Yeah. Right, so, right. Uh, so, and I was like, I looked on it and they had a whole bunch of different rallies, like six or eight different rallies throughout Europe. Some that went around the, the UK, some that went all the way down to Monaco, and, and some that went over the Alps into, into uh, Italy. But there's, one of their longest rallies was called the Baltic Sea Circle Rally, and it went through nine countries. Actually, at the time, it went through 10 countries because it still went through, through Russia. Uh, it does not anymore. And I showed it to Mercedes. I'm like, check this out. She's like, oh, my God, we got to do that someday. I'm like, yeah, that looks amazing. Like, someday we'll do that. I don't know how I'll do it, but we'll, we'll figure it out someday. And uh, Where well, there's a will, there's a way. Right. So anyway, uh, long story short, you know, we ended up uh, doing the rally, partnering with uh, Volkswagen on a loan. So. Right. Yeah. They, they gave us the vehicle. And like I said, you know, we, we gifted the rally to each other. We don't want to see our credit card bill. Actually, we paid it all off beforehand. But <laughs> right right when we got the bill, we, we paid it right away because we're like, ah, that's kind of expensive. But, you know, it, it was a trip of a lifetime. It was a challenge of a lifetime. But, um, you know, th- this was a completely different rally than, let's say, the Alcan 5000 rally. And, and so rolling into some of the statistical things as to the requirements, the Alcan 5000 rally is, is what is called a time speed distance rally. So it's a precision based competition. So you have to be perfectly on time, on route, and it's up to you to figure out the time element of it. So when you're doing the timed portions or the actual on um, on course and on route part, um, you know, uh, uh, for that part, not the transit part, um, you have to go, let's say uh, you've got a route book, everybody's got a route book. So that's the commonality in between them. But the separators are, if you do a time speed distance rally, uh, me as the navigator, you basically say, okay, you start if your car 12, you start out at 812. If the rally starts at eight o'clock, every car's out every minute. And let's say if we're car 12, we're out at 812. Then you have to, I tell Andy, you have to go 0.82 kilometers and turn right on Smith Street. You have to go 23 miles an hour that whole entire in that whole entire duration. He goes that whole entire duration. He turns. Then I say increase speed to 52 kilometers per hour or miles, whatever it may be. Then hold that for 5.27 and then turn left on Johnson and then this and that. So it's very regimented. Regiment, regimented. Gosh, I can't talk. I'm still tired. Um, but you have Specific. to be. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very specific. Mm-hmm. So everything has a place. The Baltic Sea Circle Rally is very different. And so we didn't quite know what we were getting ourselves into. And long story, very short, it's a fun run. It's almost like the choose your own books or choose your own adventure books. If you remember those as a kid where you're like, if you want to have this ending, t- turn to page 42. If you want to do this, turn to page 72 or or whatever. And, and sure. they give you a suggested... Um, yep. You know, if you want to see this, you know, ancient church, medieval church, uh, go over here, but it'll add a little bit of extra time. And if you want to go here, go, you know, do this and that and this, whatever. And here's extra tons of reality challenges and daily missions and blah, blah, blah that you have to do that are off, off the wall, stinky, fun, crazy, whatever. While you're doing this, you have to, you know, um, figure all of that out, too, if you wanted to do that. Some teams did. Some teams didn't. We tried. We did as to the best of our ability and uh, and go from there. And so but they gave you the idea of where you could potentially camp ish. You didn't have to. You could go wherever you wanted to. So there wasn't a designated spot to camp or to stay. You could stay at the Taj Mahal if you wanted to. You could stay at a hotel. You could wild camp. You could camp, you know, with with your best friend if they happen to be in Riga, Latvia, where they lived. So it was all up to you. And that was a lot harder than what we were expecting. Yeah. In the United States or around here, we call that a, uh, I've, I've heard it called a gimmick rally. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You right. You call it that. Yeah. Sure, yeah. sure. And, and, you know, just the things we, you know, went, went, like Mercedes was, was talking about, like, Alcan 5000 is some big, big rally days. So when we heard, oh, 300 miles a day, not a big problem. Oh, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but yeah. when you go to Norway no and, the, and, you know, because we weren't on those motorways and the speed limit is 60 kilometers an hour uh, everywhere, it took forever to get anywhere. And, and Andy, you should add to that the motorway fact. I don't think I mentioned that. Oh, yeah. So one thing, so 
no GPS, but the other the other big rule that they were um, p- quite explicit on was for the Baltic Rally. Yeah, was stay off the motorways and take the back roads. You know, right. you're you're allowed three, like Mercedes said earlier, you're allowed three jokers, jokers, they, motorway you know, they jokers. Call them jokers up to 300 kilometers to help you get so faster if you if you somewhere. needed to make up time or something like that you could jump on a motorway yeah up and to make some make some miles right and so uh, but you know we we tried to do everything per the rally you know spirit of the rally and whatnot so <laughs> not we weren't we're trying not to do anything you know we had to use gps for finding chargers. charging right yep. but we we had paper maps and we have the ridiculous photos to prove it that we were using them but well in in the first couple of days we were trying to figure out what justified a motorway i mean we know the autobahn's a motorway right you know when they say no motorway uh, you know we were the only non european team that wasn't from Europe or surrounding areas. Like there were some teams from the UK, at least one from the UK. There was a team from Hungary. Um, you know, basically it. Most most everybody was from Europe. We were the only non-Euro team. We were the only EV team. So the only team that year that had an all-electric car. So we had challenges. <laughs> you know, some extra opportunities for being unique, shall we say. Um, that said, we were trying to figure out, okay, me trying to order the maps. Imagine yourself going to Amazon or going online and saying, okay, here, dear Google, um, let me order a paper map from Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, and everywhere from Scandinavia and beyond. The most updated paper map I could get. Good luck. You didn't go to your local AAA? Uh, Yeah, good luck with that too. So I did a lot of research and some of these maps I could only get as new as five years old and I did my best and but what came to me and I and what I was able to find was I, I ordered two different sets of maps. So two maps from each country, but two different manufacturers. So National Geographic, um, Michelin, and there was a third. Um, Maps are still over there. I can't remember the third one off the top of my head. Um, But anyways, there were paper maps. So I knew that if one showed a different motorway or one had another road or something, then maybe the other one could cover it. What I didn't realize was how far zoomed out they would be. And they would only show motorways mostly. So I was just trying to figure out the best that I could. Um, We we weren't the only ones that were confused about this. Basically, it was like an interstate map. Right. Yeah, yeah. it was was pretty much the biggest, the biggest stuff. Like we, right. I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember what they called this, and I can't remember it. So he's yeah, Andy's googling the the autobahn sign, which is it's like you know, it looks like a highway with a bridge going over the top of it. Those were universally looked at through Europe as motorway signs, and we right. were supposed to stay off those. Now there was another one, and I cannot find what it what it was called. He's googling symbols, but they had a, a, a sign that was blue and it had a, a, a sign a, a symbol of a car. a car. Yeah, a car. That was okay because that was technically not a motorway. But the- and we were talking with some Germans on a, a before we were hopping on one of five ferries that we took on this event, and they were <laughs> saying, "Oh yeah, here like." So there's the sign oh, yeah. with a car, with a car. A and they were saying that they thought it was maybe a just car. A, just like a like a, a snow route or something. And they said they think that was okay. I don't think it was a snow route, but so we can just say that the rallies rules and regulations were pretty loose in that fact because they only had the the autobahn autobahn motorway sign pictured, but they weren't very regimented that way. So the first couple of days, Andy and I <laughs> found ourselves. Let's just say on farm roads, so much so that they were dirt and gravel that we were going maybe, oh, I don't know, 30 kilometers an hour or 40 kilometers an hour, and they were barely wide enough for a damn tractor to go down. And and we're like, we have to make 7,500 kilometers up in 16 days. How the hell are we going to make this happen? (laughs) So She was asking me this this (laughs) afternoon. She's like, what do you think the most grueling day was for you? And I remember thinking to myself... You know, as I'm as I'm stuck behind a, a tractor going about thirty kilometers an hour on some fjord road in in Norway, going like we still have like for ten five hundred kilometers to go today. Like, how are we ever going to do this? It, there were there were moments where like this just like it almost didn't feel like it was doable, but it, it clearly was. 
wild. Yeah, there was like when I was driving cross country, I was using you know GPS, but it was take and GPS does weird things to you too sometimes. Where it's taking me down these like back road, like dirt roads in Colorado. I was like, where is it taking us? Right. Like, <laughs> like we were trying to get to Rocky Mountain National Park, and it like took us off the interstate and like cut across the mountains. I'm like, uh, it's a little weird, but uh, I guess we're in it here for now. Mm-hmm. Well, one of the craziest things, I mean, there are a few instances that stick out clearly to me. And I mean, Andy and I are, are eyeball deep right now in podcasts and radio shows and, and writing articles. And I've I've got, I don't even know how many thousands of files, maybe eight or 10,000 files of photos and videos of everything that we've done, trying to reflect on everything. And, and part of us still doesn't realize or we don't realize what we really accomplished <laughs> yet, even though we we do, but we didn't, but we do. Um, but one of the craziest moments for me was Andy pointed out a sign. We're on another gravel road. I don't know if anybody else had gravel roads on their route, but we we had many on ours. Um, and, and all of a sudden he goes, is that a sign for Poland? And I said, stop, 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 stop. <laughs> and so... I looked up and I'm looking at my paper map and I'm like, and then, uh, you know, I, I, I'm just stopped for a second. I was like, what the heck? And then I took out my phone just because I got a little scared because we got, I, I knew we were really close to Russia and I got really scared because they, oh, they yeah. said, they're like, you because the Russia border, the borders are closed right to Russia. And they, they expressively said, um, do not go into Russia, whatever you do, do not go into Russia. And so I pulled up my phone. Mm-hmm. I didn't have GPS running there, but I, I looked at the map. So I, you know, digitally looked at Google at the map and I just saw where our point was. And I was like, holy crap, you're right. We're heading right into Poland. And so we entered Poland on a gravel road, <laughs> like a farm road. <laughs> I have no idea where that was, but um, I think we've got it on it the fine Lithu- tech yeah, I was going from Lithuania into Poland. But, yeah. But so it was... Just, pretty yeah. wild like every day was it just like all right start here and then get approximately to this area somehow yeah no. well uh, <laughs> so the route no, book yes. uh, you know which was this kind of choose your own adventure thing generally had a day-by-day synopsis of oh you can see this and you can see this and we recommend camping along the shores near falkenberg sweden or something like that Right. And so we would try to get to that general vicinity. At least the minimum of that. Yeah. For the first several days. And then we sort of realized like, hey, if we push hard, we can just get to Helsinki for the night. We'll get an Airbnb and we'll we'll have the next day in Helsinki, which sort of happened for us. But that's a that's a whole long that's a whole other story about singing karaoke till 430 in the morning. (laughs) Didn't involve eating. Neat. Did they Dead hear that? There's though. there's crickets right there. Did yeah, they hear yeah. that? So each day had these <laughs> challenges, and and one of the challenges. Yeah, there's no uh, toe cocktail. <laughs> no, no, not this time. No sour no, toe no. cocktail this time. Each day had these unique challenges, and one of the challenges was to sing karaoke in in Finland. Oh, okay. With the Finnish, yeah. No, no, no thank God. God, thank God. No, fin- Finnish is not an easy language. But, no, uh, no, but they said they said there might be extra points if you had an, a vanilla ice cream cone and saying "Ice Ice Baby," which I don't think anybody actually did. But no. anyway, um, but long, yeah. Long story short, we we pushed on to Helsinki because we thought we would have a whole day to explore that town, and that was a city that we we'd always wanted to go to. And so we pushed on, <laughs> but we we arrived at about nine thirty at night, and I'm exhausted because we've been driving about. 600 miles uh, and uh, I when was convinced by my navigator and wife to still go sing karaoke with other people and <clears throat> and while reluctant I went and and uh, one thing led to another and boy after if you know it I sang like eight karaoke songs and it was 4 30 in the morning eight? So uh you probably sing about 30 50 songs actually let's just say 50 yeah all right no, um all right so you there's like gimmicks uh, was there points to win to win the rally? Yeah, so there were points to win the rally. Um, so there's different classes of vehicles okay. uh, to start with, and they're worth different points. So um, there there is an EV or net zero carbon, essentially EV class. Um, that's changing. So from what we understand right now, that was worth 10 points. I think that they're taking the points away from us or oh. that that you know, classification. 
So we got 10 points for being an EV. And we were the only EV of the rally for that year. There Too were easy. previous. Take it yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. T- take it all away. Take it all away. And you, you, we haven't even talked about the charging issues we had. But that being said, and and um, but there are different classes. So um, so basically, it's an older car rally, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So you have to have at least 10 years and older of a vehicle. So 10 to 19 years, I think they call them like young timers or young guns yeah. or something like that. Young timer, and, yeah. Yeah, and I think that there's no points. And then there's like 20 years and older. And then you get like 20 plus like each year is like one additional point. And then you get 30 years and older. And then there's, you know, 30 plus one additional point for each year mm-hmm. that you're older. And then they have a fun class. It's called Slow Riders. And I think it's 70 horsepower and under, right? Yeah. Ooh. 70 horsepower and under. Which think about that. It's like 70 horsepower and under. That like our Pajero actually makes a little bit more than that. And we took the Pajero up to the Arctic and tucked the Arctic in the Arctic Ocean in 2020 in the winter. And ours new made what? Uh barely a hundred? Ninety nine. Ninety nine. So when it was new. So at the crank. I don't think yeah, at the crank. So I don't even know if ours would classify with it, probably wouldn't. So probably. there was a sixty six beetle that So there was a guy with a beautiful sixty six uh Volkswagen Beetle and he did the whole thing. Super nice guy. And uh we talked to him quite a bit and uh yeah, he, he completed the whole rally in a sixty six beetle, air cooled and all that good stuff. And then so it's, other, it's- other than the car you were in, the buzz, mm-hmm. what was your favorite cars? Ooh. Well, let me let me just um, go back. I talked about the classifications. Let me just answer the rest yeah. of your previous question first before favorite cars. Um, the points part. So there are points to win. Um, they have tons, tons, and I mean megatons of off the wall challenges, tasks, questions. You know, all sorts of stuff that you're supposed to answer. Um, a lot of these are meant for you to kind of get embedded into the rally get to know your other teams, get to know the locals, get them involved, like trade. You're supposed to trade. One of them was like trade a paperclip for something that's like, I think it was 10 times its size or 10 times its weight. Somebody came back with a vice. Somebody came back with like, you know, a broken bike frame and like all these other crazy things and that they traded. And and like, what was it? Buy a sack of potatoes and like, you know, um, cook it up with somebody else, like another family or whatever. And another one was like mow a local's lawn and take a photo with them and be nice to them or something. I mean, like all these crazy things and like smelly fish and that you have to open the can of in Norway and like have it sit in your rally car and not have it tip over and like make sure that it's there all day long. And we whatever. were told by Volkswagen we could not do that one, by the way. Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> they told and I wanted to do it. I had the Tupperware and I had the Ziploc bag and I had everything to seal it up to try to make sure that I could try to do it. And they 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 knew about it long enough or like they knew it. <laughs> no, no, about it ahead enough. They, they're like, don't do that. And I'm like, oh, shoot. OK, fine. Um, that being said is all of these, they had WhatsApp groups, um, four different WhatsApp groups. Uh, and they, so the one with points, you had to expressively say, okay, task of the day, TD one, TD one, uh, two, three, four, whatever this is, or all these things, send photos or take actual physical photos and then hand in your rally book at the end of the day and then total up all the points. So there's a lot of navigators. There's a lot of writing up. There's a lot of statistical things. There's a lot of stuff you need to do to do the points and then hand it in. Um, and as far as the, the rest of the stuff, you know, some of the teams are like, ah, I don't want to do it. I don't care. I'm just going to go for a joy ride. So um, it was interesting. I talked to the rally owner afterwards and you know, when I got the final list of who actually finished and who got points, there were only 60 teams. And I thought, well, God, my God, did half the teams like not finish? And so there were 140 starting teams. That being said, is I think 12 teams had mechanical issues to the point where they couldn't finish. And I think a few people stopped and headed home early because they had to work or they didn't want to finish or whatnot. Of the rest of those teams, about half of them decided not to play for points at all and just do the drive or just have a fun run and just be with the rally and do whatever and just go along and do whatever they wanted to do. There were only 60 people of the 140 that vied for points and finished. Of those, we finished 47th. So if you think about it, 
Of 140 total teams, we finished 47th. So I think of us having, like, you know, the only EV. Now we need to segue into favorite cars and then uh, charging challenges. I think that we did a pretty darn good job. Yeah. Anyway, so I, 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 I mean, think yeah, that... Sound, sounds like you're a 500 ball club out there. You're doing pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. So Favorite cars. There were there was I, a I, huge... Before, before, before you before you get into favorite cars, I have a question. You said it's a, a vintage car rally, yet you did it in an ID Buzz. What was the, was there a special allowance because you were electric, or what was the deal there? Well, in in twenty twenty two, they started letting in zero net carbon or EVs, so that was kind of the special exception. Um, yeah. Otherwise, everything else is pretty much ten years or older. So it wouldn't necessarily it's ten years say, or older and EVs, right? So it wouldn't necessarily call okay. it vintage cars, just older cars. I would say it's still, and you'll get to it. It's still not. It's probably just as hard with an EV as it is with an old car, and you guys will explain why. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was well, a huge mix of cars, though. Like, do you want to talk about the cars? Wildly, oh eclectic, yeah, which was. Fantastic. So uh, everything from, you know, Fiat Pandas and Peugeot 206s to old German fire trucks and uh, to Mitsubishi Pajero's uh, diesel. Uh, There were uh, Fiat. um, uh, uh, So Fiat Panda, like I said, but there was a woman who had a Fiat Punto. And and Volvo she had a sign in it that said, it's red, it's Italian, it's Ferrari, which I thought was great. So there were uh, there were things like the, uh, it was an Opel Monterey, which is the same as an Isuzu Trooper. Uh, one of the like 10 versions of the Isuzu Trooper sold globally. And he had a giant thing, so a giant <clears throat> painting of Montgomery Burns from The Simpsons on the side of it. Uh, so lots of Volvo wagons, tons of VW transporters. There was a lot. There was too. a little bit of everything. Sorry, the fire truck too. Did yep, you mention the fire I said truck? that. Yep, yeah. yep. Vintage 1982. Uh, I believe it was a Mercedes Benz fire truck, Feuerwehr, and uh, yeah, it was it was so fun to see all the different kinds of cars. I mean, these little little uh, European subcompacts with rooftop tents on them. It looked like if you got going fast enough, they'd like sail off. <laughs> And a lot of the stuff we that we couldn't even see, or like we don't we don't have available to us here. There were 140 teams, so like when we got to the finish line in Hamburg, we're like, oh my God, I didn't even see these guys. I, that's cool. I didn't know that that vehicle was there. And we when we started the rally, so the rallies first started in Hamburg, Germany, and then eventually finished in Hamburg, Germany. Um, when we started, there were over 300 teams because there was another rally from the same SAC rally group, Superlative Adventure Club group group that started called the Viking Sun. And they were kind of a half rally group because they did just the Scandinavian portion and then finished somewhere. I don't know where they finished. So there were over 300 cars there. I think 320. Was yeah, it I mean, 320? There were, there were even some like America, there was a, on the Baltic Sea Circle rally, there was even a, there was, was even a suburban, a, uh, right? A suburban like and there was a, somebody had a Chevy C10 van. I'm like, what? Like <laughs> that's crazy. Did not expect to see that. I mean, it was cool to see all the vehicles we don't get, but it was surprising to see, to see some you know American iron there as well. That's cool. Um, and the time of year? What, this was in June. It was July and August. July and August. So, well, like, July. Ju- sorry, July. June and July. June and July. Sorry. So, yeah, what was ju- the you know, you're up that far in, in north in the hemisphere. What, what was the daylight? It was a ton of daylight, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So once we once we got north of um, Copenhagen, a little farther north than that, it just never really got dark at night. I mean, there were there were times when we were camping like on the Lofoten Islands or northern Norway that you know it's like. It's like two in the morning and the sun is in your eyes. Like we didn't have any curtains or anything like that on the ID buzz. And so it had tinted windows, but uh, (laughs) it was, we, we were, we had a fantastic night in, uh, outside of Rovaniemi, uh, Finland. You said it right. I know. I I worked really hard (laughs) thinking about that. So, uh, we camped with a bunch of other rallyers and we had a super good night. And I remember thinking like, we got to get up early tomorrow what time is it? It's still light out. And I'm like, oh, it's 
twelve thirty at night. And so it messes with your system. It, it really, <laughs> it really does. You've got to get used to it. And I'm still not used to being back. Yeah, but it definitely stays lighter uh, longer uh, the farther north you go up there. Wild. Um, yeah. So, what's it like driving an EV across Europe? Because I can tell you, Brad and I rented an EV in Florida just to go from Orlando to Daytona. And like, that was a challenge to go like a hundred miles. Oh really? Yeah. 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 So before we left, we did a ton of research. I I started to put together a spreadsheet and tried to figure out what charging companies we would need uh, while we were there. And so I kept running into Reddit threads and, and Reddit discussions about charging in Europe and how, yeah, the infrastructure, everyone kept saying to me, by the way, even here, oh, the the infrastructure in Europe is so much better. So the challenge became how to pay for these things, because here in the U.S., you pull up to an, you know, an EVgo or Electrify America, and, you know, you, you, you tap or you swipe your card and you start charging, assuming the charger works. And in Europe, each charger charging company has its own um, app and there's no, in most instances, there's no card reader. So you have to pay with that specific company's app or proprietary RFID card or tap card. So I tried to, I tried to do this as best as I could. So I did as many, I did the research, I put together a spreadsheet I then realized I couldn't download any of these apps in the United States. The Google Play Store would say, the app not available in your region. Yeah, out of region. So I'm thinking, well, okay. So we reached out to our our nephew, Paul Crony, and he lives in in Germany. Germany. Yeah. And he says, I'll loan you an older iPhone that I have. He says, I don't use it for an alarm clock. And so he, he wiped the phone and installed the apps that, I thought we needed. And they also sent away for the tap cards or for the, for the charging cards because you can't get the cards unless you have the app, and I couldn't get the app. So anyway, fly over to Germany. Uh, we, we test it out, and it works. Okay, cool. So our first charge was on an island in uh, Denmark, and it worked. And I that, that really sort of eased our concerns about charging. I'm thinking, okay, because t- t- to be honest, I was the reluctant one on this with the EV. Mercedes is like, oh, we'll make it work, blah, blah, blah. And so then I think it was a bit of a role reversal once we got there. Is I think she was a little bit more reluctant. I'm like, oh, we'll figure it out. But so, but this first charge worked great. So the second charge was in Helsingborg, Sweden. And we pulled up to a Circle K. Yes, the same Circle Ks that are here. Um, and they're wildly popular in, in uh, Scandinavia. But they have a We're, lot better food. Yeah. And we uh, we went up to charge, and none of our charge cards, none of our apps would work. And I thought, oh, Of like crap. the dozen plus apps that we downloaded that should have worked in all nine countries? This is after going on a slight wild goose chase trying to find a charger that was actually behind locked gates because it was closed. The the, the store that oh, the I charger was at that. was... Yeah. It was supposed to be at a Hornbach, which is like a... Uh, Home Depot. Home Depot. But the oh, Hornbach God. was closed already, and we didn't realize the charger was on premises. Anyway, so we find the Circle K. We go to charge. Nothing works. For giggles, I saw that there was a QR code on the on the charger. I thought, okay, I'm going to try it with my U.S. phone. Wait, for giggles? At the time, you didn't think it was for giggles? Was not, <laughs> there was very little giggling going on at the time. I, I know <laughs> the stress. I, yes. I feel it. Yes. So <laughs> anyway. Everything is funny behold, in memory. Yes, yes, this is true. So Type two anyway, I, I thought I'm sure the German iPhone would get it, but I wanted to see if I could get it with my, my US phone. And sure enough, Sweden let me download it. So, okay, cool. Shocking. So Circle K let us download this app called Elton, as in Elton John. I don't think there's any relation. And then, uh, although there was a tiny dancer charger. No, I'm just kidding. So anyway, <laughs> that's a joke. So uh, we download the Elton app, and it allows us to charge in a lot of places in, in Scandinavia. Yeah, Elton ended up saving the day, little did we know. Yeah, but we got to Finland, and then Finland had eight, there were 
ABC was a charger. I'm like, oh, okay. God. And there was D- Ionity. Okay. And there you was. You might as well talk about the ABC since you're on a roll. Oh, yeah. Since so you managed the. Google Translate I'm... was was our, our best friend because we went, we found out there was no. I should back up one second. So we have all these charging apps, some of which work, some of which don't. And they generally have a map of where the, where the apps are, excuse me, where the chargers are on the app. And the problem is, is like, we're not finding any. So we had third party apps like Charge Finder. And we would use or Charge Electrum Finder apps. or Electrum apps or some of these other ones. And so uh, a better route planner was another one. And so we would try to find them using these third party apps. And so we're in Finland and we can't find anywhere to charge. And okay, there's a, in this town, uh, there's a, it wasn't Karas Jock. I don't remember the name of it. It doesn't matter, but there was a ABC. Sure. Your statistical queen can look it up. Yeah. And so (laughs) ABC. Okay. So we find the ABC charger. It's a fast charger. And so, uh, we go there. I'm looking for the Q. There's no QR code to download the app. I'm like, how do I get the app? And they're like, okay, here's the website. So we'll go to the website. And the website allows you to download the app. So I download the app. But this was this was what just kept happening over and over and over. But just when you think you got it, there was then another app that you had to download. And mind you, time-wise, um, that if you think about everybody running in for either diesel or petrol, you have maybe a quick bio break. And you fill up and you've got, if you're quick, 10 minutes, right? We had to stop and charge. And we tried to have reserves always ready, right? So we knew that, you know, we had a strategy to say, okay, we're going to have probably no fewer than 30% in our tank, quote unquote, (laughs) tank. Um, But because we knew that if charges were broken or we had issues or we couldn't connect or things like that, that we could at least try to get further, farther, um, farther, further. I always get that screwed up. Um, but have another opportunity to connect somewhere else, hopefully. Um, so that was our plan. That being said, um, it, it made a challenge for us just to try to figure out how to make all of that work. Right. Um, and, With all of these apps, all these charging cards and all of this, it it just, it was a plethora of challenges and just to lay this all out on the fly just made it really um, interesting, right? Um, Interesting now. (laughs) Interesting now, frustrating before, but once we got connected, the ID buzz was really easy to show us okay, it's going to take you this long to charge. And you could have a slider on the infotainment screen. If you wanted to slide to 80% or charge only to 80%, it was going to take you X amount of minutes or 100% it was going to take you to X amount of minutes. So once we got connected, um, the ID was just flawless to say, okay, you wanted to go to, you know, however amount of percentage, just go to whatever, da, 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 just do this and da, da, da. And it just, it was great. It was perfect. So it wasn't the how the vehicle worked. That was never the problem. And it, it was wasn't even finding tank. chargers. Right. It was not finding chargers. It was not the vehicle. It was the how to pay and the apps part of it. That was what was fascinating to us and a bit stressful for us because we were so, we felt so, so prepared going into it. Did you have any trouble with the chargers uh, doing the handshake with the car? And letting it charge? So all? we didn't have any problems with that. But what we found was depending on the charging network or the country, some you had to pay first, then initiate charging. Right. Some you had to plug it in and initiate charging, then pay. It just kind of depended. It was There was no standardization. Like in Germany, we always had to plug it in first, then pay. Right. And, and what we realized too is um, with people that had ICE engines, right? Um, in internal combustion engines, they had a lot quicker of an opportunity to just, you know, fill up and go. So we got up a lot earlier time-wise, right? So we got up like, uh, what, probably 4.30 Four in the morning? Four or five, depending on the day. Four, 4.30, five o'clock. Usually we were up. Mostly. It was light out already anyway. Yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> we're, like, we're like, you know, yeah, it was light out at two. So <laughs> most of the time, so it was like, we're up already as it was. And we're like, oh, it's only two o'clock. We got to sleep, sleep longer. So the whole entire trip was like, huh. But anyways, that being said, we were up and out 
usually I'd say at least two, three, maybe four hours before some teams. Um, But as we went along, we had to stop and charge for half an hour, 45 minutes to an hour. And as the day moved on, we had at least three charges every day, if not two to four, most times three to three charges. And that made us lag behind as other teams caught up every day. There was an app too, by the way, that all the, all the teams use called Find Penguins. It's yeah, a really cool yep, app. Yep. And this app allowed you to see where all the other teams were. So we used it a lot just to keep pace of the rally. So we wanted to make sure, like Mercedes said, we'd get up early and we'd kind of pass everybody still sleeping. And then by the end of the day, they were generally ahead of us because we had to charge. So, But we used that as a barometer to make sure we weren't falling too far behind. My, my, our biggest goal, I shouldn't say my biggest goal, but our biggest goal was to make sure that we would finish and we'd finish within, I think it was a three or four hour window of saying, you have to be in Hamburg at the fish market, right? And you have to be here in between, I think it was 11 and four or 11 and three, I think it was on July 7th. So the rally started on June 22nd, finished on July 7th. You have to be here within those hours. Otherwise, you do not count. And it doesn't count. We were going for points. We knew we had a challenge on our hands. We knew we would not place really well. We just, we wanted to prove a point, I guess, for lack of better terms. We wanted to make sure that we um, did as good as we could. We were unfamiliar with the vehicle. We knew that this vehicle was not in North America yet. Um, So I sat in it. I sat in the prototype. (laughs) I... Uh, don't have any more experience with it. Andy's not even seen it. Well, in Iceland, he saw it driving with a crazy taxi cab driver. But other than that, that that's all we had. So as an automotive journalist, our job is to get in, drive it, and go. So and learn as best as we can, pay as best as we can as far as charging, and make it work. So that was our goal, and we did it. So I say we did good. Yeah, it sounds pretty cool. I mean, that's. Uh, again, Brad and I, we didn't have to go 16 days. We went, you know, a hundred miles in like two days, but it was the same. Even in Florida, I had to get like four or five apps and some of the charges worked. Sometimes it did the handshake with the car and it actually charged. One of the times it like, we had a Chevy Bolt. It like started to charge and we're at a target. Like, perfect. We'll go inside, get a coffee, come back out. Came back out, it stopped charging within like five minutes after we left it. Oh, no. We've had <laughs> yeah, that happen. We had too that a few happen. Times. We were charging outside of Gdansk, uh, uh, Poland, yep. and we started, and all of a sudden I'm like, oh, crap, it stopped charging. What the heck? So we plugged it in again, initiated charging, oh, it God. started, and then all of a sudden this uh, these other two people <clears throat> came up, and one of the guys was from England, one guy was from Poland. They worked together, and uh, he says, I think your charger stopped working. I'm like, what the heck? And he's like, welcome to Poland. I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so uh, we got talking with them. And we, it took three times to, to get a, a full charge there because uh, it just kept shutting off. But you have to say where we were. We, we found ourselves, tw- was it twice or three times at a Volvo, yes. Volvo dealership of all places, charging our VW at a Volvo dealership, charging. I mean, that's pretty crazy. I, I think that's pretty crazy, but th- it's cool. But it was really interesting to have that opportunity. It's it's certainly nothing's unified yet. It, it, no. it will get better, I hope, because huh. that's the only one that's going to work. Yeah, uh, right. And- it's, it's certainly difficult if you're not an enthusiast into electric cars to really be like, hey, go use this electric car because it's not. It's not as straightforward as they want it to be. And I, I'm hoping it'll get better. I know it'll get right. better. <laughs> right. Do you want to talk about um, 2027? Oh, yeah. There's legislation that uh, basically is going to require chargers to allow people to pay at the at the charger. Oh. So I believe it starts in 2027. So they're going to make it so every charger going forward has to have a new charger is going to have to have a way to pay with a credit card. And then at some point it'll go retroactive where all the existing chargers have to be able to uh, allow you to pay with a credit card. So is that for the EU? Correct. Right. Yeah. Well, so not for yeah, you. I mean, it's getting there, but it's, it's, yeah, it's similar. It's funny. It's like the similar challenges here. Like I don't, like you were saying 
oh, the charging network's better in Europe. It's like, well, it sounds kind of like it's the same here. Uh, the charging network is more robust. There's more chargers, or it certainly yeah. felt like there were more chargers. And we ran into far fewer broken, non-functioning right. chargers. But the you know the the, the debacle the debacle came to how to pay. Yeah, they still shouldn't uh, they shouldn't take away points for an EV because it's still hard. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you got ten points extra for being an EV, so that yeah. was good. So, yeah, I mean, it's just like. You know, we take for granted driving around uh, gas cars. You can just like fill up in five minutes and gone. And then, but it sounds like you also, you made use of that time to at least cook, right? And yeah, lunch and stuff. Yeah. So we, we learned, hey, okay, rather than make breakfast at camp or whatever, let's just, you know, we'll down a granola bar real quick. And then we'll, you know, when we have to charge, we'll pull out the the stove or whatever and make some coffee and whatnot. So we, we learned that charging at the charge, excuse me, cooking at the chargers was actually a, an easier way to do things, help pass the time. We did that many times, both, you know, in, you know, Norway and Poland and actually pretty much everywhere. We, we just found, Hey, we'll just pull out and have a snack or have our, have, have lunch or whatever. And, and that worked really well, by the way, truck stop food, it's so much better there. It's unbelievable. Like you go to a you go to a a Circle K. They have really great hot dogs and whatever. Okay, but we went to Seven Eleven in Norway to get a <laughs> cup of coffee. It's probably like I don't know eight in the morning, seven thirty in the morning. The best. And they had this fresh salmon and egg on this amazing baguette. It was like eleven bucks U.S. Oh. and it was amazing. And I, I like we'd go to. Some of the McDonald's would have charging stations and we'd stop there and use the bathroom and charge. And I'd walk in, I wanted to yell, like, 7 Eleven has fresh salmon. Like, why, why would you eat here? here? Why do you want to eat at Mc- Mickey D's? It's I, I've actually heard some rumors and grumblings that 7 Eleven has been purchased by a Japanese company. And a lot of the ones in America are gonna start having similar food to the Japanese and European 7-Elevens to try to compete with. <gasps> yeah, you know, that would be great. So, yeah, 7-Eleven is a... Is a... Go ahead. They're, they're building some brand new 7-Elevens here in Phoenix, and they are oh. large, and they are very, very much in the vein of, like, the, the QTs <clears throat> that we have here, which are, which are much nicer, and... You know, co- competing against that kind of stuff. Yeah, they're going to stock a lot of the same foods they have in their Japanese and the European stores here as well. Starting on yes. the West Coast, so good for us. And then moving its way east seems to be the plan. So, hopefully, there's hundred percent truth to those rumors. I saw That's the same great. thing. Seven Eleven is a Japanese company, and apparently, they're known for certain foods in Japan. They have apparently these egg sandwiches or something. I saw something about that. That's what we had: egg salmon sandwich, and it was delight. It was one of the best things I ate in the whole entire rally. Yeah, we, we like couldn't believe it. And I, I'm just like, man, it's like a race to the bottom in the U.S. for truck stop food, and and the other the rest of the world. Iceland was amazing. Germany was good. The, the 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 Nordic countries were amazing. Even you know Estonia and, and Latvia had you know you'd stop at the at the convenience store and they had good food. Oh, that well, did you talk about the cafeteria stuff? No, like, I mean some some of the a lot a lot of the I mean a lot of this is shocking to us because <laughs> we we just have like inedible food um, whenever we go somewhere to eat in in this country. I think I feel um, just personal bias, but. Um, when we went overseas, some of these, uh, uh, gas stations had cafeterias that were literally sit down, beautiful restaurants where you had cafeterias next to saunas, mainly Finland, but they just had gorgeous food. We're like, I have no idea how much this is, but I just, I want to sit here and live here because <laughs> it was just, it was amazing. I just wanted it. We took photos. I mean, I didn't eat there because we didn't have time, but I just, I just was in, in bewilderment. She she also mentioned one thing, like the truck stops in Finland had saunas, or as they would say, sauna. Saunas, it was yeah, like saunas. wow, that's that's wild. Saunas were everywhere, including flo- like floating boats. Not like you'd have like non floating boats, but like boats, like <laughs> literally <laughs> boats. <laughs> yeah, like sa- that's no, probably like, available. Yeah, literally, like you we had boats with saunas on them, and including Helsinki. I'm like, you'd have like. 
there was a the boat there was a boat well we had at the karaoke night day whatever you want to call it where that ended at uh 4 30 in the morning um we did our walking tour after that the day after because we decided to push really hard ahead and we um had the walking tour we passed this how long would you say it was it was a big 100, 150 boat. It was a, foot yeah it was 100 big. 200 foot maybe i don't I would know say 100 100 foot boat okay and it had a sign out there. Of course, we couldn't read much of it, but it said jacuzzi, sauna, and karaoke. It was an old Finnish warship. I just yeah. was on the website yesterday <laughs> looking at it. Oh, seriously? It's like an old Finnish uh, military ship, and they've turned it into this party barge. And <laughs> I mean, like, party barge. it was, <clears throat> yeah, it was wild. To think that we love our American football and things like that. And they, I mean, imagine, I mean, the, the rally said in the root book that the Finns love karaoke. I'm not kidding. When you have a, a previous warship that has been turned into a sauna slash karaoke slash jacuzzi warship. I mean, you can't make this up. <laughs> that sounds cool. <laughs> I haven't, uh, I haven't been to that part of the world yet. I, I uh, keep meaning to get up that way, but um, we can give you all the pointers. So, you know, you did this huge road trip in an EV. Have you done a, a huge road trip in an EV before? Or was this the first time? We had done a uh, we had done a, a about five hundred miles in Texas in a Hummer EV SUV <laughs> uh, during the uh, eclipse this this spring. But uh, Mercedes, she has done some stuff. Yeah, yeah. In 2021, I partnered with Volkswagen of America and I uh, drove the, I was the uh, driver on record for their ID4 uh, when it was the all wheel drive uh, version of the ID4 when it was very first released um, to drive that for the Rebel Rally. And I was the very first crossover to finish, um, to actually compete in and finish the Rebel Rally uh, with that. And so that vehicle, and that rally was about 1,500 miles all off-road, um, mainly all off-road. I think it was probably, I don't know, 100 miles of pavement for transits to connect you from route to route off-road. But um, that was uh, pretty but that good. Was, yeah, that was a, an organized event that there was charging at, in the evenings. Right, so with, it wasn't really a road trip, but she still did quite a bit of miles in an EV. Mm. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, it was eight days of competition, seven days with scoring, you had, I mean, you had, yes, you had base camp at the end of the day where you had the opportunity to charge back up, but it was still up to you to not run out of charge um, during the day, which was a huge feat in itself because you didn't, you, you had to plan your own route to hit um, probably 20 to 30 different checkpoints. You didn't know the terrain. It could be heavy rocks, bouldering, silt sand dunes um you just didn't know you didn't know how many miles you would hit you didn't know anything and it was all no gps map and compass based i was the driver i had my, um, my navigator emily winslow i've partnered with her for multiple years she's awesome and it was a huge challenge and so volkswagen of america said hey we want um, you to test this. And I, you know, they sent me out to the East Coast to drive the all-wheel drive ID4 and um, went ahead and I drove it. And then literally a few days later, they took one of the actual media vehicles from that drive event from uh, the journalists and shipped it over to the West Coast and had it built up mildly, had it built up and uh, kept the stock height and uh, built up the Rebel Rally and away we went. Not in Estonia. Not, yeah, not in Estonia. Yeah, this one. This one was for the U.S. This one was uh, the Nevada and California deserts. So we started near Tahoe and pretty much finished down near the Mexico border. So I, I just I bring up I bring up uh, uh, Estonia just because <laughs> it was in Estonia that we realized. Uh, I'm sorry, it was in uh, not uh, uh, Latvia. It was in Latvia that we realized that. While we could use Tesla chargers in much in every country we had been to that we tried, uh, we, we couldn't in the Baltics. So um, Estonia was we, we were in Riga, Latvia overnight, 
And we had to drive 43 kilometers around a city of 650,000 people to try to find a charger that worked. So some of the areas in Europe are more advanced. Like it, it, uh, in Norway, Norway's charging was incredibly easy. And in the Baltic nations, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, as well as Poland, but really Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, it was harder to, to charge. But we had the most broken chargers in Norway. There were also more charges in Norway than anywhere. Hmm. It was fascinating to log everything. Mind you, I've probably got a 50-page document of everything I logged along the way. Because, you know, I like statistics. So, you know. Yeah, it seems like the use case for having an EV is if you you want to be able to charge at home. Like, that seems like, and you're just driving to work every day, charging right. at home, no big deal. Um, right, right. It's when you try to push it currently on like a long road trip. It's a little, little bit trickier. So, oh, yeah, yeah. They, and you know, I, I've said this a, a few times. There's no reason to have done this rally in an EV. Like there wasn't a requirement, nope. anything like that. Uh, unless you're doing it to prove a point, or you're automotive journalists, like we are. There was, there was no. There's no reason to do it. We were the only EV this year. The, the, the rally, we were told, had been done about 10 to 12 times by EVs in the past. Um, and it it's definitely adds another another layer. But, you know, most people are just charging at their house, going to work and running some errands and coming home, and it's all good. I mean, if you think about it, most of everybody that has an EV stays within a certain bubble, right? right. They know their chargers. They have a charger at home, whether it's their house charger, maybe an upgraded one, right? Or they have, you know, oh, they go here or there or whatever, and they have their nearby chargers. They might go to a further away trip or this or that or whatever. They might map it out. They're not going to do a 16-day, nine-country crazy rally uh, like we did way across the world like we just did. Yet. In a vehicle. Yet. Right. Yet. Um, in a vehicle that we are unfamiliar with. So we know, and we knew going into this, that we were the unacceptable, uh, unacceptable norm to this all. So, um, but this was a grand experiment for us to see if we could do it. And we did it. And it's doable. Actually, just kidding. We're actually living in Lafayette now because we're going to be a charge. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but it, it's so... It's doable. I mean, you, you have to take sex. You have to, you, right. You you have to pack patience, flexibility, and just just be aware. Black licorice candy that helps too. <laughs> if you're into that, <laughs> he's extra spicy at all. Um, but literally, it it just it's most people will never do anything like what we just did. But what we just did is doable now. It will get easier, especially once they say in 2027, whenever 2027, whatever month, they decide to say, hey, you know, credit cards, uh, you can do it with new machines, retrofit uh, old machines and make it happen. That will make it much easier. Yeah, it feels uh, it feels pioneering right now to try to do it. Yeah, that's a and, and, that's a really good way to put it. it I, is. I never thought about it. I mean, like, but like yeah. I said, we're not the first people to do. It. We're the first Americans to do it in an EV. But but like, Boy, this so rally. Well, like, there's been there's been ten to twelve other people that have done this well, before. I, th- so. I think ten to fifteen or fifteen or something like that or whatever. But yeah, you, you're totally right. It it is at this point. If you were to dry dry uh, just you know draw a line in the sand. It, it, it is. It, it's kind of a mishmash of private companies, apps, charging cards, RFID, keys, apps, and like... It's like the wild, wild west. It, it is. It's yeah. like a whatever everybody can kind of put together and like throw on the table. It feels like the time period in the United States when cars were first starting to become popular, but pre... World War II, so like the interstates haven't been built yet. Right. And you want to drive across country. So it's possible. Right. It's just more difficult and slower. Right. Yeah. Right. That's, we keep saying like, well, I've told a number of people, like, at some point there was no gasoline infrastructure. Yeah. And like, listen, I'm not some, I'm not a person that is a drum beater for, you know, making everybody 
change over to EVs. Like I don't. I, I the bottom line is is it's a it's a it's a part of the automotive landscape right now worldwide. And right. as automotive journalists and reporters, we decided we wanted to experience what it would be like to see if we could do this. So I don't care if you if you like EVs or you don't like EVs. We're not here to change anybody's mind or influence anybody, but we wanted to experience it. Right. And we took a snapshot in time with an important vehicle that we felt for the North American market to say, okay, what is this going to be, right? And so... Is it going to work? Is it not going to work? We don't know. Let's make it happen. It's like he, the bottom line is, is the, the ID Buzz is probably going to be the most practical EV you can buy if you don't need a pickup truck. Right. Or, or like, you know, a Lightning or a, or a God forbid, a Cybertruck. And so I shouldn't say that. Anyway, but, you know, the... the Clearing my throat. The, uh, the ID Buzz is, is, is really going to be a practical. It's a practical vehicle. It's going to be right. like any other minivan inherently practical and if you want an ev this is going to be a, a very practical choice do you know uh off the top of your head what the msrp might be have they released that for the united states no not for the united states i can tell you that our short wheelbase small engine with it had like pretty much every other option available on it it was it was eighty two thousand. uh Oof. what would a what would a Equate to eighty two thousand U S dollars. Yeah, that's so. It was really not cheap. So no. I don't know. I I'm gonna guess. I have no. I have no. Yeah. Inside info, but I'm gonna guess that ID Buzz is gonna start around sixty. We in the US. we had a call with Volkswagen of America again today. We asked again today if you have any information today to let us know. Um, please do because we have people banging down our door. Right. Why and, need to know additional information? Please let us know. Right. And we also so, know the PR responses. We don't comment on future products. So, yep. Yeah. So but they, they, that's fine. But we so know. I'm going to guess you're, you're going to be able to get one between 60 and 65 to start with. If you want the all-wheel drive 300 and whatever horsepower version, I'm going to guess. 363? Um, I can't remember. I'm going to guess it's probably going to be, you know, in the, in the 70s. And, and we'll easily touch 80 if you wanted yeah. to. I, Just I a will, guess. I will right. say my my major complaint generally with electric cars is that they try to make them look too much like not cars. Right. Like right. some sort of right. weird future bubble thing. Sure. And right. At least oh, with the ID Buzz, Volkswagen. it's got Yeah. It's got a little bit Volkswagen of a retro general. style, but modern. Right. I yeah, I have in general they're pretty to... good with that. Like the golf is good, the ID four looks right. like a standard crossover. They they're they're pretty right. good about not doing that. I, I love the look of the ID4, and I'm not just saying that because we used one. I've seen a few of them, like ID4, or the ID Buzz. I'm sorry, ID Buzz. Uh, I belong to. We belong to this ID Buzz group on Facebook, and there's like a guy in Denmark who's got one on bags and and like 20 inch BBS wheels, and it's so clean. It looks so good. And I think as far as us, I mean, Andy, do you want to talk about any critical opinions that you have if we're talking oh, about yeah. the buzz? And then I can give my opinion, my opinions. And, yeah, just just real quick, a couple of things that we good found. Thoughts too. A couple of things were like the cruise control, and this isn't an ID buzz thing. I think it's just a Volkswagen thing. You know, a, a long tap is would up would go up ten kilometers an hour. A quick tap would go up one kilometer an hour, and that was difficult to use. Like we would, we I would try to just wanted to go up just a couple of mile, a uh, couple of kilometers an hour. And all of a sudden now we're going 20 kilometers. You know, the other one is the camera system on it reads the speed limit signs. And so we'd be in a hundred kilometer an hour zone. And then for some reason it thinks it's all 50 kilometer and we all of a sudden slows down. I'm like, no, 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 stop it. Stop. <laughs> Stay at a hundred. And then the infotainment, which by the way, we're told is going to be revamped for 2025. Uh, uh, is more like operating an iPad than it is operating a car. And so some of the things, like I just wanted to turn the fan speed on. Like it's like three or four menus or taps mm-hmm. deep. Which is not a, by the way, not a problem unique <clears throat> to Volkswagen, but just, you know, infotainment. Just make it easy. Yeah, I, if they could just stick with buttons, which oh, I think no the kidding. EU might be mandating some things be buttons, I thought I heard about for cars because they're just worried about like haptic touch stuff like it's just a little too much when you're driving like yeah totally 
I think there's a couple of things for me. The buttons for um, HVAC is a big thing for me. Um, volume control, huge and mute, huge. Make it a button. Give me a time. dial for God's sakes. Yeah. Give me a dial, yeah. please. I want to just mute. If I have to have mute immediately, make it happen. Um, the other thing for me, a couple things. Um, apparently there's a camper or a camping setting that I just learned about after the rally uh, that we didn't know about. That really? There's a, apparently, I just read it on a forum or um, on Facebook. So all the settings for the uh, the USB-C outlets, they can- Of which tr- there were about seven. Yeah, there's a lot. There's actually, they're, they're strategically placed, which we loved, um, among the back where we had the cuckoo set up. Oh, we need to talk about the cuckoo. Um, but anyways, there's a, a full dog camping system that we had that we could sleep on, which had cooking and washing and, and um, you know, that type of setup, and which we slept on. So we realized that we couldn't power any of our devices overnight. And so, but apparently we can, we just didn't know how. Huh. No kidding. But I think there's a ca- camping setup that we need to change. There was one thing like we I had just, to know, we noticed like during this camping was they had an internal motion sensor. Yes. And we learned that you had to turn that off unless, because like the moment you if, turned over in your sleep, the car alarm would go off. If you are, if you locked it overnight. Yeah, that was it. And then we, the second you moved, all the alarms would go off and you were like, woo, woo, woo. And you're all like, oh crap, oh crap. And you're trying to wild camp. In the middle of nowhere, and the last thing you want to do is make noise. So <laughs> we didn't know. I mean, so we figured that part out. But apparently, you can make some outlets make be constant huh. or on. But I just I'll saw that, and that was after we got back. So of course, right after we got back. That being said, um, making that work. Um, a couple other things. There is an outlet for a house plug. That I, that's at the footwell in the front and center of the passenger seat. We had how many cameras? Two cameras. How many GoPros? A two GoPros. GoPros. Uh, tons, two laptops, tons of devices. I mean, we had tons of stuff to charge. So we always had something that we had to get charged along the way because we were mostly camping. We had probably 80, 85% ch- uh, chance of uh, camping along the way. They had one outlet that was that type of thing. Um, it was there and I kicked it out every single time. And I would love to have that moved because it was just there. And I, with my feet moving, I just kicked it out every time. Like these are the little minor things. It's not minor like things. you know, a wheel fell off or something. You right. Know? But I mean, these little things that are like, if you're going to use it as a camper van, you know, you've got to, You've got a. There's a lot to it, you know. I mean, modern right. cars, modern EVs, as as we all know, there's so much tech behind them. But it, I mean, if if you could make it so that maybe the 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 outlet is on the rail on the rear of the seat, so that you can make it that you can you know plug in the devices on the back side, so it's not by your feet and you don't kick around and you don't move your feet, so it doesn't kick out. I mean, hey, just a thought. I wonder if they'll do like a high roof version, like an old old uh, VW van. Don't they have a California? Like a uh, Westphalia. Yeah, they've talked about. There keeps being there keep being this. Uh, I don't know, like Calif- rumor that they're going to come out with a California version, which is which is kind of like the the um, factory supplied uh, pop top and with all the camping goodies. And hmm. so I know they had initially said there wasn't enough demand for it, but yeah, I don't know. It'll be interesting. Sure. <laughs> so, um, I mean, would you do it again? Um, I would do the rally again. I'm not sure I would choose an EV though, to be honest. I would love to do the rally again. They, the SAC rally. So SAC, does so many different rallies. I would love to do it in winter, and I would love to do the highest summit one. Oh, the European Mountain, Mountain Summit, yeah. Right. Oh. They they pared down on their rallies right after we came back. Um. So I'm bummed that the one that we really wanted to do, which was their, European Five Thousand, yeah, European Five Thousand, they got rid of, which I'm so bummed about. 
but you know, it is what it is, but, um, yeah, I love to do another. Oh, um, what about, uh, you did some charity work for this rally too, before we close out this podcast. What about that? Yeah. So everybody on the rally, all 140 teams, one of the asks is we're going to do some good in the hood. We're going to, every, every team was supposed to raise at least 500 euro for charity. And that can be any charity. The, the rally, if you, if you can't figure one, uh, the rally supports Movember for men's health. Uh, but we decided to support the Jesse Combs Foundation. Uh, they do some great work for women uh, who are uh, looking for, um, uh, or they support women in the trades. Uh, they do some scholarship automotive work, trades. automotive trades specifically. For surrounding areas. Right. I used to work with Jesse Combs. She was an amazing person uh, and her spirit lives on through this, this organization. So we, uh, we actually made it past $500 within eight hours and we ended up raising about 3200 uh, U.S. dollars for the for that yep. organization. So, oh, nice. uh, yeah, yeah. Again, you know, it's a good organization. Something we believe in. It was, she was somebody I knew, and uh, uh, so yeah, we knew. We were very happy to uh, to have done that. So. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Um, well, do you have any? Uh, um, sorry, do you have any other uh, adventures coming up? You want to plug or tease? Oh, well, we'll be in uh, Pennsylvania here this weekend for Subi Fest, uh, Boxer Fest, technically, uh, one of the Subi Fest events. Um, I will be most likely going to Overland Expo Mountain West and then uh, Alcan 5000 2025. We're, we're starting to uh, put feelers out for that, and we haven't, uh, we haven't chosen a vehicle or anything like that, but uh, we are already signed up to do it. I believe we're officially car 10. 10 and uh but we're we're planning on doing that the route is a little bit different than it has been in the past very different so but five thousand <laughs> miles over 10 days throughout the u.s and canada at least and, summer uh, quite a bit of alaska uh, alaska which is a summer rally so right so right. that's a uh, that's about a year away but you know plan 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 yeah uh, for, i mean you need to do an ev <laughs> not, yeah. not, not, okay. uh, work, uh, yeah. work on that's a Andy. sore spot on that one <laughs> work on Andy because I've yeah, been no. trying to work on Andy for that the and infrastructure is not there in that part of the country the yet. Infrastructure how about a, how about a hybrid, hybrid. So. The, okay we'll do a hybrid I would do a hybrid infrastructure is not there and the only reason the only way that I could honestly with a lot of research the only way that I could see that being worked is with a towable trailer possibly or um, movable, um, movable uh, EV charge points. Yeah, so which could be let's done. Stick but with a hybrid. A How about that? A lot of work. It like I said, done. I'm not in. I'm not here to prove a point about EVs or anything like that. But uh, and I, would, I am. Yeah. Well. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. So I think you That's just. Point. Yeah. You, you and your <laughs> listeners see. There's a little bit of a rift there. <laughs> I think there's uh, Ford's coming out with an all-wheel drive hybrid Maverick, so you know maybe there's something there for you. This is this is true. Hey, yes, you we never are familiar know. With such vehicles. You don't you don't know what vehicles we may be uh, talking about that may or may not be one of them. May have made the short list. Well, well, as, a, as, yeah. a, as a Maverick owner, I support that. Oh, yeah. I'm the last person on earth to have not driven a, or to have driven a Maverick. I still haven't driven right? one. I, I love them. I think they're super cool and Me so too. practical. And I, I really want to drive one. Yeah. Right? Right. What is Naomi's is a two wheel drive hybrid. Ours is the front wheel drive hybrid. Yeah. Yeah. Two wheel drive. Ah, hybrid, yeah. Yeah. Good what, to know. What, what, she gets like better than the rated MPGs usually, right? <sighs> We're a little low now because of the winter. Sorry, the summertime AC yeah. on all the time kind of kills it a little bit. But in the wintertime when the AC worked less hard, we were we were averaging between 49 and a half and 51 miles a gallon. True real world mileage. That's pretty good. Wow. That's yeah. and I'm I'm glad to see Ford decided to offer the four wheel drive or the all wheel drive uh, with the hybrid because I, I think a lot of people asked for it. Um I'm yeah, I think, I still I think, think there were some two, packaging three, turbo issues fun. they had to work out. Um ah. And now they've they've fixed that because I know a lot, a lot of the hybrid stuff is where the all wheel drive assembly stuff would be. So there's been some packaging changes, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, no, I'm a. We don't talk about it much on the podcast because we talk about old cars and it's a new car. But I'm I'm 100 percent in love with it. So we've had it almost a year now. Ah, it's cool. That's awesome. Has it been reliable? Good to hear. It's been it's been great. I mean, cool. The only, the only reason it was ever in the shop was for an oil change, and when it was there, the 
<laughs> famously to our listeners, the dealership smashed it up. So yeah. it was down for a while for that. But um, other than that, it's been fine. It's been great. Been it's been a great car. We've driven it. Just out of a couple road trips. Just out of curiosity, out of curiosity, did you consider a Hyundai Santa Fe or Santa Santa we Cruz? Not. We did not. Okay. Um, which okay. is funny because we came out. We were coming out of a Hyundai. She had an uh-huh. 11 Sonata that she had for almost his entire life. I think she bought it in early 2012. Um, huh. And she just fell in love with the Maverick. And the price point of the Maverick was really what brought us there because. Sure. It, huh. The Hyundai with equivalent options was like 12 grand more. So oh, it wow. just didn't make any sense. Wow, so, sure. really? I mean, it would have been easier to get the Hyundai. We had to order the Maverick and then wait 376 days for it to come in. Ooh, wow. Or, or, or buy one with a markup. Yeah, it took a long time. Uh huh. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, I've driven the Santa Santa Cruz and and found it to be a lot of fun, uh, especially on road. So, um, yeah, I, I one of these days I'll get myself into a Maverick. I've yet to drive. Come on down to Phoenix, please. Take it for a ride. <laughs> yeah, you go. Challenge accepted. All right, uh, Andy and Mercedes. Where can people find you? We are crankshaftculture.com, or we are Crankshaft Culture, and our website is crankshaftculture.com, as well as pretty much all of your uh, usual uh, social media sites, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, X, X. on and off, <laughs> a little bit of the TikTok. So, uh, but yeah. Yeah, and we're right in the middle of um, doing our Baltic Sea Rally uh uh, rally recaps. So we're on day 12. You can find of 16. You can find us, uh, via, um, Latvia right now. <laughs> yeah. We're uh, on Instagram. We're currently in Latvia. Yes. Nice. All right, cool. So, uh, you can follow auto off, po- auto off topic podcasts on, um, Facebook and auto off topic on Instagram and threads. I am raced in anger on Instagram and threads. Uh, and Brad, where can they find you? I am TSISS350 on Instagram and threads. All right, cool. So as always, keep cars analog and name the roses. And uh, thank you to Mercedes and Andy for coming on. Thanks for having no, us. No, appreciate Great to be there. Thanks for having us. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, once, once again, we are uh, living vicariously through your world travel driving rally stories. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right. Have a good one. Thanks. Thank you.